Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another book discussion between the NRA's Book Club and Ann Arbor District Library. Tonight, we are discussing The Verifiers by Jane Peck. This is a mystery, I guess you would call it. Um, and before we get started, we'll just do a brief introduction. I will start. I'm Lucy. I'm a library tech in the youth department at the library, but I also do a lot of adult programming. Um, I am a white 51-year-old female with brown glasses, a black sweater sitting in front of a wall of watercolors. I'm Emily. I am a librarian at the Ann Arbor District Library. I manage the kids' fiction collection, but when it comes to programming, I do things for adults. I am a white woman in my mid-30s. I have long reddish-brown hair and two braids. I'm wearing a green shirt, and I am sitting in front of a mostly white wall uh, with a uh, print of Matisse's goldfish. I will pop in. I'm Beth. I am uh, on the outreach team of the Ann Arbor District Library. I'm uh, also a white middle-aged woman um, with dark hair that's got a mind of its own today and uh, a couple windows behind me with some plants. My name is Jacob. I am also a member of the outreach team at Ann Arbor District Library. I am a 29-year-old male with short blondish hair. I'm wearing a light blue and white striped shirt in front of a bare white wall. Hi folks, I'm Fatima Hawk. I am a co-facilitator for the Annie Race Book Club. I am a South Asian woman with short black hair um, in her mid thirties and wearing a black top um, with a virtual background of fluffy pink clouds and a blue sky. And hello everyone. Please let me know if you can't hear me properly. I'm trying some different headphones. Perfect. Great. Hi, I'm Sheila. I'm the founder and co-facilitator of Unerase Book Club. I'm a uh, Indian American woman in my early 30s with short brown, short black hair uh, and a yellow top with glasses. And behind me is just uh, a blurred background of my study. And to give a quick synopsis of the verifiers before we jump in, the verifiers is like Lucy said, a mystery, but also a conversation about um, tech and dating apps. Um, all rolled into one and family day. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that. Um, and the, the plot line is there's um, a, the main character works for a, a technology company or um, a dating app company, sorry, that uses uh, another piece of technology to verify if that person is who they say they are. And in the process, it turns out that um, somebody has gone missing. and the, uh, the main character takes it upon herself to figure out what's happened and a lot of things unravel. So like we like to start all book conversations. What did y'all think of this book? I can jump in. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I just found it like a fun romp of a read, but with enough things that, and it's fine when books are just a romp of a read, but this one had enough like things to think about as far as data and privacy and how we represent ourselves in the virtual versions of ourselves. because even if you aren't online dating you there's you still have a virtual version of yourself uh, whether it's through email or social media or however you present yourself to people who you don't know very well um so i i just enjoyed being along for the ride with this book and then occasionally um because i was listening to it on audio and so my husband kept picking up on things um and we met uh, through online dating and he is an engineer and I'm a librarian. So then, you know, getting the little side conversations about what, what our privacy is and how our data is being used today. Uh, I loved that this book that I was reading both for work and honestly for fun, I would have kept reading it even if I didn't need to keep it, reading it for work, uh, was just sparking real conversations. So I highly recommend it. I, I really liked it too. I um, and I also ended up listening to most of it. I I had it checked out and didn't didn't read it quick enough. But um, I, yeah, I, I just I love the uh, the protagonist, uh, her voice, her character, her descriptions. I mean, she just cracked me up, uh, and she was just super honest and uh, to, you know, as a as a as an author. I mean, as a narrator. So. 
good one. Yeah, I also um, really mm -hmm. enjoyed it. Sorry. I I really enjoyed it too. Yes. Um and I I thought I, I really liked Claudia. I thought she was like Beth Beth was saying, she's a really um fun and funny character. I love the way she biked everywhere and she was just kind of like fearless in that regard. Um I liked having a queer main character where that wasn't really like she wasn't suffering because of that. It wasn't, you know, like uh um I mean there was some family dynamics around it, but it wasn't like a big turning plot point and um it really made me think a lot like Emily was saying sort of about what in how much we're willing to give up information like what we're willing to get what conveniences and and what additions in our life are we are we hoping to get how much information about ourselves are we willing to give up because all these apps are collecting information and and um we all you know everyone engaged online is, is giving up some part of themselves. So it made me think a lot about what is known about people and what is true about people. I really enjoyed that these thoughts about um, how our data is used and dating online and family relationships. I loved how we were able to engage with those topics, supported against this um, who done it? Or this this kind of um, classic style mystery. Um, I love all of those things. So to have them all in one book, I was like, this is nice. I will say I really enjoyed reading this book, and there were so many unexpected things for me. One was um, just the, the depth and relevance of the data privacy and security issues that come along you know so like you all said it gives you so much to think about uh, about the personas that we put up online um and also what we give up that the book kept honing in on that one point of people are unpredictable and they lie or they lie to themselves and they don't like they think one way and represent themselves in another way. And that just gave me so many things to think about. And it also made me really curious about how we present ourselves to other people in a virtual space. Um, and then the second piece was that I was totally unprepared for was the family dynamics. Like it was such a deep uh, conversation about a, um, I guess a family narrative that we may not be as familiar with. So Claudia has two siblings um, that grew up in um, Taiwan, I think. Uh, yeah. And so they, um, her, her mother dropped them off there where she grew up with her mother in New York. And so there's, there's the tension of connection to um, Taiwan and also other family members and also this feeling of like who is the favorite and whatnot so I really enjoyed that I enjoyed the fact that it, it wasn't just a throwaway thing that there it was actually addressed through conflict and dialogue between characters um, yes yeah, so excellent so I um Tendentially, but like very much part of this conversation of how we present ourselves online. Um, I recently read Momfluence, um, which is supposed to be a critique of how um, parenthood, specifically motherhood, is portrayed online and through social media. Um, I'll save my critiques of that of the book, but the biggest takeaway for me with that, with even the idea of critiquing mom fluency, is by putting like a very specific version of yourself online, you become so deeply invested in maintaining that version of yourself that it can become very difficult to detangle your real self from your internet self. And um, I know like dating apps are very different in that they're um, they're very fleeting. Like the idea is that you don't have to be on them for very long. You don't have to have that profile for very long. But like, what does it mean to represent yourself? Um, even in that particular um, applica application of a digital identity. Um, and like, does that bleed over to other parts of your life or are people able to keep them their actual interests, their actual sense of self separate from maybe the catfishing profile? And um, reading Monflix like really had me thinking about the ways that 
even like my friends and people who are not famous try to influence with their own parenting online and uh how kind of weird this idea of putting that part of your life online really is but that's not related to this book that's a completely different book <laughs> You know, it's I um, was reading some interviews with uh, with the author Jane Peck, and there's one I don't remember which one it was, but she says something about, and this is about dating, but it's making me think about what you're saying, Sheila, too, with with the moms about like this merging of real self and online self, and do you even know who you are? But um, Jane Peck said the idea of online dating is premised on the idea that you yourself have a clear understanding of who you are and what you want. And I never really thought about that aspect of it before. It's just like, you, you know, you have, there's a lot of people who don't, who are like still wondering who they are and yet they're putting all this information forth. And it just was like another piece of the whole conversation that really got me thinking about um, what we present about ourselves and how true we need to be or how true we think we're being. So. Yeah, I, as someone who has recently rejoin dating apps you know after a long period of being like I'm so sick of dating apps I'm not dating so like it took a eight month break from dating altogether because I was just wanted uh, wanted that reset um but you know one of the things that I noticed is that a lot of people say that they want connection and they want uh, all of these things but then they don't actually put in the work they won't respond to messages they drop off fairly quickly there's like no effort made to like create or sustain conversations um it just it almost i mean and i think that it also goes towards the apps themselves. They want to keep the user online for a long period of time and the user is the product. And, and so I've read articles about how, how you know, the, having so many options or thinking you have endless options kind of makes you think like, I don't actually, I've got time. I can, I don't have to put in the effort, et cetera. Um, so this thing about people not knowing what they actually want, I think it also gets confounded or per perhaps it just gets messier because there's also this tech that's manipulating us um, and kind of structuring the way that we respond, that initial high of matching versus um, then the, you know, like I want to have more matches or whatever, you know, the scientific reasoning that little dopamine hit. So so yeah, I was definitely thinking about that. I recently read um, an advanced reader's copy for a book by Nathan Hill that's coming out this fall called Wellness. Uh, he wrote The Knicks, which is one of my favorites, has nothing to do with this conversation. But Wellness uh, has a section of it where it talks about how, I think it actually called it Facebook, but if not the Facebook stand-in pulls a user in and transforms how your mind works and how you interact with social media. Um, and reading that, and then like a week later, reading about this, this app, it just made me think about, like, it makes me like not want to share any information with me with any company ever, even though obviously in the world we live in, that's impossible to do, but it's just, it's so insidious. And the idea that, of course, all these free things, if it's free, then we are, our information is the cost that we're paying. And I like that this book did not um, tiptoe around that. Um, and that Claudia, like there's, there's something telling about the fact that she's, she's in this place where not only does she kind of know how these matchmaker apps work, but she's even got the access and the know-how where she could essentially verify her own matches without having to pay the buckets of money that their clients do, uh, but that she does not have anything to do, want to have anything to do with that, despite the fact that we see that, you know, she certainly has some desires maybe to have a partner in her life. And we see how the dating in the real world works and doesn't work for her, Um uh, but that it, there never seems to be a moment where she's even a little bit tempted to sign up for one of these. Uh, and it makes me wonder, uh, you know, taking it from the novel to real life, like what do the single people who work at Bumble or Tinder or whatever 
what do they think about do do they use their product and then I also want to know like do they have like secret behind the scene ways to know like is their profile really being seen and all those I think I would go bananas if I was in that place with that potential information I I have never online dated so um I can't even imagine that, like, like being in the work of it like that. And like you, you were saying, um, but I, I did, uh, I did watch an interview with Jane Peck. I don't know if you guys m- might've catch caught it. Um, she mentions that she met her wife um, through online dating and it was, they were each their first matches to each other, which I have to say was the same thing with my dad and his wife. And now, and they were married like way at the beginning of online dating. Uh, But that was kind of their claim to their relationship fame was they were each other's first and only. So anyway, it was, I was endeared by that um, aspect of it. That's wild, Beth. That does not normally happen. As someone who maybe hasn't dipped her toe into it, it is very much not how it usually works. Wow. Okay. Good to know. Yeah, I was always you. taken aback by, I'm sorry, I keep on talking over you. I'm no, so sorry. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm with, with Beth. I was married before um, these apps you were around, so I just don't, it's... um. But, you know, my kids use them. So it's it's interesting to hear about it through that aspect. Um, just and like I that's one of the reasons I like this book is because it's like this whole new um, inside look. So sorry. Go ahead, Jacob. Um, th- I, I think that, you know, you spend a lot of time hoping that one day you'll bump into somebody at a coffee shop and then you're just like, no, actually, I'm going to get to work here and I'm going to get on the apps and but then you give up so much of yourself to find connection. So it, it, it's, it's like, um, I'm looking for a partner to uh, fill up my cup. And in order to do so, I'm emptying my cup. And it's like, oh, this feels like a weird game. Um, and I think for a lot of people, the end goal is the online dating. It's like, I want to like meet people and like talk to people and like perhaps enjoy um, as some sexual trysts. And the person's end goal is not always to find a relationship, but you don't know that. There's just so much unknown, which also makes it the perfect topic for a mystery. Because a mystery, it is. Um. It's the this article did just come out in relating to what you're saying. Um, most uh, most uh, Tinder users are in relationships or married. The majority of them. <laughs> wait, wait, no. About no. half are. Um, <laughs> Sorry, are I can't. I that blew my <laughs> mind. I can't. It just came out. <laughs> and do they do they divulge that or is that something that they don't? I mean, I there was a survey um okay. and they yeah, they there was a, there was a whole research study thing that was done. Yeah. So if an organization like the verifiers actually existed and let's say you had let's say money wasn't an issue. Yeah. Would you want to know? Well, okay, so I don't I don't know about whether or not there's an actual verifiers that exist. However, there is a lot of new things that are happening in the dating world that involves verifying. So there are Facebook groups that only women join and they're like and it's city or region specific. And they're like, I'm dating this dude. Does anyone have information about it? And that's how they find out if this guy's in a relationship or not. Um, there's also TikTok accounts that will like, uh, if you submit profiles to them, they will do a deep dive into these people searching public records and other things and being like, this guy is actually on a, you know, um, those sexual uh, 
registries, so sex offender registries and stuff like that, they'll do that sort of research. They'll tell you if he's married. So, so there is this economy around it that already exists, whether it's information sharing in a Facebook group or someone like gaining a lot of followers and such on TikTok. So it's happening. Yeah. And the it really came into the fold. I, I don't remember if it was earlier this year or last year when there was the, the West Elm Caleb story where um, this guy named Caleb in New York who works at West Elm was apparently dating a whole lot of women in New York. And and they all realized it and got together. It was a pretty big thing all over TikTok. But to ask your question, would you use it? Not if you couldn't pay me. If, I don't know. If, if I can't ver verify you a year down the line... Like, if you need to be verified, then that's not going to work. Like, if, you, yes. if you're so iffy that you need to be verified. But yeah. there's this, there's this negative or toxic need where it's like, I need to know if this person's for real. So but I how get do it, you know they're but, for real? Like, that's, that's my question. You know, I'm like, it could be a bot. I mean, how, like, how do you know? I just... I don't know. Yeah. I will not go into this whole story on a recorded Zoom, but I have a great one. So when we see each other in real life again, <laughs> I can go into this. But I had a very long relationship with someone who was um, not entirely who they were saying they would be. Um, but I will say then going into dating again after that and being pretty open with about like, hey, so this is my past. So I'm not going to be as trusting as you want. And so, you know, thank goodness my husband was all for it. So he was like, pretty early on, like, here, look, here's my actual college degree. See my name on it. And so I appreciate that that information got forwarded to me. Because I think otherwise, especially early on, when I was going back into this world, I would have found myself very tempted to verify things um but like it doesn't also feel like a good way to start things off you know you hear so much about relationships based on honesty and all of that and uh when do you tell the person even if you verified then everything was great they were exactly who they said they were then do you have an obligation to tell them okay well i i did i did check up on you so thanks for telling <laughs> me yeah it's so interesting to me <laughs> Okay. I mean, I, you know, I haven't dated in forever, but you better believe if I did start dating anybody, I would Google that guy or, you know, and it seems like you'd, you'd know, I mean, already I, I, I make a judgment on certain aspects of things, you know, with, if, if I want someone to be my friend even or pursue or, you know what I'm saying? But uh, anyway, so, and, and would I though, well, we all have the opportunity to pay money to, you know, look up people, right? We get those kind of um, hits on the internet and I never have. Um, so, but no, no one's been that important to me. It's just like some random person. <clears throat> like, <laughs> anyway. Here's another thing. If I don't want people knowing my information, like I am try to be as private as possible online now like this is like uh within the past few years like really closed off what I share um a lot of personal stuff like that doesn't need to be online um because I'm extremely wary of big tech I would if it happened to me if I don't want somebody searching for me I want to give that same risk to a person and potentially go on a date with and when I did do a lot of dating I plus years ago I had like my own like in, internal algorithm to figure out if this person's for real or not. And RIP out bar in Ann Arbor. Uh, but I used to go there for dates. Right? With uh, going on dates with straight men, I needed to be in a space where there's a lot of other straight men to like potentially protect a, a date. Um, and I like had a flow and I, if somebody like gave any sort of weird vibes, done so. It was easy to end it. Um, and like, even in conversation, you can figure like, 
at that point you could figure it out. Now there's bots. So it's a completely different ball game. Um, but like to Fatima's point, it's like people don't want to put in the for whatever reason you're trying to like get to know a person, you figure it out pretty fast. And also, uh, I don't know, it just like ruins the surprise of getting to know somebody if you've done a, a huge deep dive on them or if you paid somebody to do a deep dive. And then lastly, um, on one of the most recent episodes of Lost Full Teresa's with Matt Rogers and Bo and Yang, they were speaking about, or Matt Rogers was talking about um, how like how disingenuous and how it like, breaks his trust when he's like gone out on a few dates with somebody or like hooked up with somebody for a few times. And after like the third time, they say, oh yeah, I knew who you were because he's like a minor, minor celebrity. Just be upfront. Like if you've done research or if you're like, familiar with who that person is um I think I don't know I wouldn't want somebody to be like oh I totally listened to a podcast you used to do or I've watched these Ann Arbor calls with you three dates in or three meetings in meanwhile Fatima my one of my best friends over here first time we met she's like I know who you are I've listened to some of your stuff <laughs> that, that was my opening <laughs> I was like I listen to your podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. that's a fair thing i would say that to if i saw you in person i would be like oh my god uh, mm -hmm. um in fact i thought i saw you at the library the other day but and i was like were you there fatima yeah i'm always there <laughs> yeah i did but i, I yeah I, I was there picking up a book yeah should have said something anyway um back to the book yes uh, Okay, so one of the things that Emily mentioned, or no, I don't remember who it was, but just about maybe Fatima, the, the relationship and how it wasn't just a, just of the family, the dynamic, and it wasn't just like a cursory aspect of, of something in the plot, but an, an actual plot and deep into it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very, it was touching, you know, and um, th the aspects of families that I, I can't relate to because I don't have you know, family members that were raised elsewhere, but I'm sure it's something that a lot of people experience. Yeah. I liked how with the, the family sections too, it wasn't just like, here's our story. You know it from the beginning. Um, and so it was really kind of surprising to me midway through when you realize that Claudia is her mother's favorite. Because when you compare her to her two siblings, you know, she's got um, Charles, who is wildly successful in his job. Um, and you've got Coraline, who is so beautiful. Um, and, you know, as much as we all, I think, loved reading about Claudia, perhaps because she was a flawed character who is still trying to figure out her way. So I was really surprised Um to get those pieces put together that like, oh my gosh, their mom is so much nicer to her than to these other two, two siblings. But it's interesting. I know the book, the main thing is in theory, the mystery. That was the part I cared the least about. I, I was interested in like, as we talked about all of these data dynamics and then the family dynamics and then the mystery. Sure. I enjoyed it, but um, that's not the part I'm going to remember about this book. Yeah, the, the mystery aspects that well, like that tied into the mystery was um, more like Claudia's brain and how she processed the mystery and how she was always thinking about, um, I can't remember the name of the, the series. Yeah, yeah, like what he would have done or said. And then um, the other books, you know, like Jane Austen, and she just, it's almost like she would just fly away into this little bit of a fantasy world and and um like it's so excited that she's playing private detective that sort of lose sight of what the actual mystery was and that, like that part of it I I loved that I loved the way that other books and, and this other mystery was um was tied in. it was just part of what um endeared Claudia to me I, you know she was a great character but that that mystery aspect I thought was really fun I think uh, I will really uh, go ahead I think I will disagree with um the like I had the complete opposite feeling about the constant referencing and meta-analysis of mysteries based on the things that she read um, from mystery novels like that actually 
started to feel a little tedious to me where I was just like, tell me the facts of your story. I don't care about like literary analysis of like mystery novels as a genre um, and what what uh, um, Detective Yon would have done. Um, so at times I found I, I found that a little frustrating, but I but I did appreciate how frequently she like that was part of her characters that she read a lot and you could see that you know her reference to books lots and lots of classic books um and and the way she viewed the world I appreciated that a lot I was just gonna a quick story about like how watching or reading detective stuff could really play out in real life um so my husband makes a lot of fun of me because I really enjoy cozy mysteries all the way to like thriller mysteries and I watch Murdoch Mysteries, which is a Canadian show. Oh, yes. I see we have some fellow Murdoch watchers or familiar people who are familiar. And he makes so much fun of me for watching it because it's super cozy. Um, but uh, one day he like lost the handle to his coffee grinder and it was missing for like two days. He's like, I don't know where it went, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't know. Oh, my God. Like, what am I going to do? I buy a new whole new grinder. Whole thing. And he... He like was jokingly, and he was alone. He's like, I'm going to pretend I'm Murdoch and I'm going to retrace my steps. And he immediately found it. And he's like, I hate so much that this helped me. <laughs> it's always the last place you look, you know? It's funny. Um. Can I go, ask a question about um, a little bit later in the book and the technology side of things, um, going back to our our um, points about the what we present to ourselves and whether or not we're able to detect that someone is being false. Um, the story that one of the through lines is all the fake profiles, the AI-based um, bots that ultimately, or the sense, as they call them, ultimately are trying to influence you or to perhaps keep you on the app or find out more information about you or try to detect it. Um, and I think one of the interesting things for me was that um, towards the end of the book, the synths become unrecognizable to the verifiers, and which makes me a little bit, more than a little bit terrified, right, to think about it. Um, so I was curious about like what folks thought about the fact that the this is this is actually going to be quite a reality now, right? In terms of how, uh, moving forward, um, and I'm I'm just curious, like how people have been feeling about the creation uh, and maintenance of these AI personalities. You could so easily see someone falling for one, especially if you're a word person and are more comfortable interfacing with someone on an app than you are meeting in real life. I, I could see that being a very easy track to fall down because the thing is, is whether you're talking with a robot or a synth or you're talking with a real person, you are still filling in their story in your head and you are making up things that you don't even realize you're con consciously making up about them. Um, so like when I was in the online dating days, I would, I know that I very easily get into that filling in a story for someone. So I was always like, let's meet, let's meet as soon as we can. Cause then it will either it'll work or it won't No, And usually it didn't, but like, I don't want to, I don't want to waste any more time falling for this version of you I'm creating. And I think that must have to be the strategy you go into if in this world, that maybe we're really living in where there are more and more realistic AI, unless the point that you're going into it is maybe not the physical companionship, but just companionship in general. And then if you're getting the satisfaction in the, in the, the conversation, how much, how much does it matter if it is, oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm now like, delving into the answers of this question in my mind. And I don't know that I have a good answer, but I think about it um, also with seniors. 
because uh, I, I worked in senior living for a little bit. And uh, the idea of being able to have companionship through something with AI, especially as their caregiver shortages and things like that. Um, and I remember hearing about it at a conference, like, I don't know, five years ago and thinking it was the coolest thing. And then going back and talking to the residents at the retirement community where I was working and they were all terrified. They said, no, that'd be awful. And so I don't know, like, is, is it a, if it gives you the companionship that you need, doesn't matter that it is. AI. I don't think it would matter necessarily, but it could take a turn, you know, I mean, that's, and I don't remember what I was listening to a podcast, a podcast about AI must have, maybe it was this American life. I don't remember, but um, just how, how uh, the, uh, the, yeah, well, it was this American life, but uh and I can't get too deep into it. It's just that it's like AI is becoming, or we're very much like AI in that, you know, your your mind can get, can veer, right? So, and so like the AI also can get, um, I don't know, pick up on other be- behaviors, I guess, other words maybe that uh, I think was the point of it. Like they would, they started to, some of the companion AIs started to uh, just get sort of abusive to the, I know, do you I, know what I, I'm talking I, about? Yeah. Yeah. So I remember um, reading a couple of articles, especially about just like trying to get them to leave one, one was like getting, trying to get him to leave his wife oh. uh, and, yes. and being like, oh, you know, um, you actually love me more or something like that. Like, and then also using certain manipulative words. I think that's what forced a lot of these AI engineers to, to then like ring the alarm and say, this is actually very scary. I'm actually very scared. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's, it's kind of um, brought to mind for me a little bit, like on the flip side of it, that one of the stories in that collection we read by um, Ted Chang, where they were like creating AI to, you know, are these bots for like this, it, it was like a long project to create almost real people. And they were concerned about how their um, bots would be manipulated, but like, here's the whole other side of it, right? Like, it's just, it could be a two-way street. It's, I mean, and like the way the synths are described in this book, it's almost like they are manipulating the way people are thinking. So it's just, it it was making, it was reminding me of that story and like how, how much um, we could come to rely on, on artificial intelligence to, fill in or to, to supply companionship. There's such a loud part of me that's like, you cannot replicate the human like connection. But then it's like, well, no, of course you can. And it's not as simple as like, I've created this one true thing and it is human connection. Like if I'm in a place where I am in need of connection, I will be more apt to receive it from bad actors, bots, my ex, somebody I met three times. You know what I'm saying? So it, it it's really complicated. What and this question has been asked many times by many authors, many filmmakers. It's like when what happens when the AI is like, I don't want to be in the computer no more. <laughs> like I want to like do what you guys are doing, and that's just really. I just watched Ex Machina, if anyone's familiar with that film. So it's like very literal, like, I, I don't want to be in the computer anymore. I want to hang out, which is just a crazy thought. And a version of that has already happened with the the robot that decided to turn itself off after five or after like a certain short time, a few minutes of like working on it on the line and and realizing if this is going to be my forever, then the better decision for me to is just to shut myself off. Which I thought was fascinating. 
apologies for, for the grimness that is the conversation, but I think the AI conversation is just scary and, and unknown uh, in general. I, I realized that I was being tagged by a, a bot. I mean, I, I didn't know it the first time, but on Facebook, it was like some, some guy was, uh, hey, I really uh, like the things that you comment about and I, I can't friend, you know, but could you send me a friend request? And, you know, the first time I was like, no. And I clicked on it. What it was so weird is the second time it happened in both of these um AI bots are in the military, you know, so it just, I, I, I was really proud of myself. I think it was had to, had to do with my reading of the verifiers where I was like, you know what? You're not real. I can tell. Uh, so I'm not clicking on that stuff, but I, I could see that people are so vulnerable though. I think a lot of the scams that are going to be perpetrated by AI are actively preying on lonely, the loneliness epidemic, which obviously impacts a lot of seniors, impacts a lot of men, um, and it impacts a lot of young people. And so I think these scams are going to become very sophisticated very quickly. And we're already seeing how like TikTok and Instagram are really good at scamming people into behaviors or into purchasing items that they like that are not real. Um, and this is only going to become more pervasive. Um, I listened to a Wall Street Journal podcast episode a few nights ago about the impact of creating, making chat GPT safe on the actual people who help build those guardrails. And it's like really horrifying to re like just remember the human impact of creating safe AI um, and on the flip side, the human impact of not caring about what inputs go into an AI or an AI program. Um, but essentially the people who were hired to do this work are people who work in, who live in uh, Kenya, who are hired through a, a second, like a social impact, digital social impact organization. And they were tasked with basically calling all sorts of violence and flagging it as this, this is not an appropriate answer. This is not something that shouldn't be used for providing support for like anybody who's considering self-harm. You shouldn't be encouraging it, stuff like that. And the impact on their lives. Um, and then chat, G or I'm sorry, open AI parent company, like didn't do anything to financially support their well-being um and it's like there's this isn't just a tech or ai conversation it's a, across our like across all of our different sectors of how do we maintain the mental health of people who are doing the really hard work of keeping us all safe issue and I'm like scrolling through my Goodreads now trying desperately to find the title of it um and I can't um so stay tuned because a, a quick google but I really it gave me a lot to think about and it's interesting to hear you describe it because the way you describe that job sounds very much like the made-up job in this book that I read uh, which is just like or like you were mentioning Jacob Ex Machina that came out what close to 10 years ago and now it is feeling just like a, a lot more like I, I'm interested in re-watching it now I'm glad you reminded me of its existence um, because it was more of just like a thought discussion when it came out and now it is feeling like huh this this could be real Sounds interesting. I mean, I remember when it came out, I didn't know anything about it, but I just liked saying it, ex machina. Okay, I found it. The book is called, um, We Had to Remove This Post, and it's by Hannah Burvots. Burvots. I don't know whether you'd call it a long novella or a short novel, but it was a pretty quick read, uh, but also a little bit disturbing. So recommended with with some warnings. Well, now I'm sitting back and I'm kind of thinking like, what does AI do that's good? I know there's gonna be a million things. 
Uh, so I actually work for an AI company. <laughs> oh, there goes my wife. Okay. Uh, we use we use predictive modeling to. Oh um, well, you locate... better spill. No, we use we use predictive modeling to locate um, blood service lines. That's and, awesome. Course, like, yeah, yeah. Like we're not doing anything nefarious. Like there's a lot of good applications to uh, AI. Unfortunately, um, there's not any regulation. So part of what my job has been is. Um, educating and working with state regulators within a very specific part of the bureaucracy to provide or create really good guardrails that aren't specific to this particular regulatory issue um, that can ideally be replicated across different parts of the bureaucracy. And I mean, uh, bureaucracies have a lot going on and they're very understaffed and overworked. And so the hope is that states can really get these um, guardrails and um, they themselves can understand what AI means and like what the statistics mean. Um, so that way they can assess what's coming through um, with potential like startups that want to sell to them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but like there's a huge tech de uh, dearth or tech, uh, what a tech debt um, at the state level. It's as of like four years ago, it was um, an average of 10 years in debt. At, at the state level. So you can only imagine what the federal government's like and Congress isn't doing anything to actually critically think about the impact of data on our day-to-day -day life. Instead, they're just saying no, 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 which isn't helpful. Like it's going to be there. What we need is more data privacy, um, the ability for people to opt into their data being shared as opposed to having to opt out. We need more um, like just education for policymakers to get us like a grapple on what's actually happening. Um, and that it needs to be the big check against technology companies going wild with data sets. Um, also today, uh, tangentially about the idea of data sets, I was listening to a science magazine podcast episode talking about um, these huge projects going on across the world to diversify the language uh, that AI is building off of, because right now AI is only building off of English which means if you don't speak English, you're immediately left behind, your culture is left behind, your perspective is left behind. And there's a concerted effort um, to create small but very high quality language data sets for, um, a, for different algorithms to work off of to keep those cultures alive in the virtual world, which is like a fascinating idea in and of itself. Yeah, when you ask about some of the good things, I was actually using uh, Chat GPT earlier today because um, my husband is trying to teach me how to uh, make a Python code that will help me with the super search puzzles that I'm making for AADL so that there are not accidental words that get discovered at the end. But he knows too much about it to be able to teach it well to me. And so we've been using the AI to dumb down, he knows what I need to learn. And so then he'll help formulate the question that I'm asking the AI to explain to me. And then it explains it simply with directions and examples that I can see. And it is like, it feels kind of magical. Like I think about the little bit of programming that I had to do in grad school. And if I had had this tool, not so much to write the programs, because that's you know, cheating, uh, but to explain the concepts and give me just like the most basic amount of information I need, like it's actually working pretty well, um, which is just kind of wild to me that it can be this good of a teacher. Now, it helps that I have someone who is also looking over it and making sure that it's not lying to me, because that's the other problem is it's very good at pretending it has the information that it may or may not have. So, you know, maybe not the best teacher. Um, but with checks, it's been working great. I'm going to have to try that. I've been afraid to, I mean, but I know that I, we chat with bots and, you know, like website, you know, and, and they can never really, they can only add, answer a few things, not specific things. Yeah. So. I guess maybe this AI business starts getting airy when it starts dealing with people people um and that's kind of like in this general way when i say the word people i don't know exactly what i mean but it's like replicating is, in an attempt to replicate humanity there's so many different um pitfalls or 
space for bad things to happen. I don't know. I there's so much for me to chew on now. Does anyone um, uh, hear anything more about a uh, a sequel to this book? I think I read that um, she, the publisher, like uh, um, gave her an advance for a trilogy. So there is a next one that she's working on, and then there should be a third one, which is good because like when they at the end of the book, you're kind of like okay what's next you know um so i was excited to read that i will absolutely be asking about that when we talk to the author on tuesday july 25th at 7 p.m eastern standard time on our um, instagram at unerase bc so if you would like to join us please do or follow us so that you can keep up to date with our all our author interviews small plug yay <laughs> When you all chose this book, did you realize that AI and was going to be such a huge piece? Because I, I know you choose these like a year in advance, right? I read this last year and put it on the list. And I was like, I don't know, maybe because we read um, The Right Swipe last year in July, which was also about dating apps. And I was like, OK, that'll be like the through line then, because we didn't pick a romance book this year um, unintentionally. But uh, then I like as we were gearing up to send the email, I was like, oh, darn. <laughs> like, this is extremely on the nose, um, which, again, like, hopefully it educates people and helps them, like, think critically about how they're engaging online. Yeah. Well, it's definitely made me more fearful of dating apps, so. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um. Okay, we're coming up at the top of the hour. Is there anything that you wanted to share that you were not able to as yet? Okay, cool. Well, I am super excited for our next month's book and I hope that folks join us in reading it. It's called How to Read Now. It's a book of essays uh, and it is uh, quite uh, explosive. It's, it's very smart. It might take you a little bit of time to get through, um, but it gave me so much to think about. She doesn't just talk about reading in the literal sense of reading a book or a text, but she also talks about a lot about critically analyzing um, the things that we consume, whether it be television or news or, or like movies or social media or whatever else. Um, and it is incredibly smart. I love this book when I read it last year. Um, and I hope that you will join us for that. And thank you as always for making time um, for us and for this book club. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you for leading us in such a good discussion and giving us great books to read. We love it. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Bye.